Good morning. I'm State Senator John DeSanto, representing Dauphin and Perry Counties and the Republican Chairman of the Senate Banking and Insurance Committee. It's my pleasure to welcome everyone to this bipartisan, bicameral virtual seminar entitled Bitcoin and Blockchain Technology Basics. It's great to have so many of my House and Senate colleagues registered for today's event, as we're very fortunate to have Peter Van Valkenburg as our special guest. Peter is Director of Research at the COIN Center, a leading nonprofit research and advocacy group focused on public policy issues facing cryptocurrency technologies based in Washington, D.C. Peter's a graduate of NYU Law and is a self-taught web developer. He's testified before Congress, brief members <clears throat> of the EU Parliament, and has educated policymakers and regulators around the world. Peter was previously a Google Policy Fellow and worked on projects relating to digital privacy, security, surveillance, and copyright law. The reason I asked Peter to join us today is to provide us all with the fun foundational knowledge we need to understand this rapidly emerging and innovative technology. In recent years, there's been a swift acceleration in the adoption of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Fortune 500 companies and mainstream financial institutions have taken positions in this new asset class, and digital platforms are making cryptocurrencies more easily accessible to consumers. Blockchain and cryptocurrencies have been heralded by many as an immutable, decentralized, and highly efficient means to transfer value and records throughout the globe. This technology's immense possibilities have resulted in increasing applications and record valuations for these assets. While today we'll cover many of the basics, it's my hope this seminar initiates at further conversations on Pennsylvania's role in encouraging these new industries for the benefit of our businesses and consumers. States like Wyoming and many others have already taken steps to enact new laws and regulatory frameworks seeking to become national leaders in technological advancement. It's my intent to make Pennsylvania more competitive and a leader in this emerging blockchain technology. I'd now like to ask my Banking and Insurance Committee Democratic Chairman, Senator Sharif, to offer a few opening comments. Senator? Thank you, Senator DeSanto. Uh, again, it is so it is, it's great to be with you today. And I want to thank everyone from the COIN Center who's joined us uh, and all of our colleagues that have joined us as well. Um, the topic of cryptocurrency uh, and how we proceed with it is, is, is really important. It has become one of the fastest growing commodities. If it's a commodity, that becomes a question. Is it a currency? Is it a commodity? What really how, how regulatorily should we treat cryptocurrency? Um, how do we how do we uh, create and foster markets? Should it be traded on a commodities exchange? Should it be traded on currency exchanges? Should it be traded on a securities exchange? What are these are some of the issues that as a country and as a commonwealth we'll have to deal with? We also need to think about ways to foster and and look at what what are the job growth opportunities that can be created? How does this help grow our economy? These are some of the important issues that we're hopefully we'll hear from, we'll hear a testimony about today. There are so many people, particularly uh, our young millennials and 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 the exennials who are in school, who are coming up, who are looking at this as a, as one of the frontier industries, an industry that is that is poised that has that is poised for growth, and is in fact growing right now. An industry that could facilitate additional commerce, uh, both here and abroad. Additional uh, an industry that could help us grow our economy. This is one, of, and I am so pleased to have an opportunity to participate in a bipartisan way uh, with you, Senator DeSanto, and other members of the Senate. Ultimately, all of us want to grow the Commonwealth's economy. Then we, we and as as we grow our economy, we can make good choices about how we make additional investments in resources, or how do we curb, cut back taxes, as opposed to how do we, uh, why, whether we have to cut services uh, or increase taxes. Ultimately, the decisions are always much better in a growth economy. And this is the kind of discussion that we can have that is focused on growing our economy. Uh, and so I'm glad that we're doing this today. And I'm glad we can uh, get some information about how we, as a Commonwealth, can help foster and grow uh, this emerging industry. 
Well, thank you, Senator Sharif. And uh, Peter, I'm going to turn it over to you, but I hope Senator Sharif did not scare you using the word testimony. This is just a presentation. We're, we're, we're not <laughs> scored here. So go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Senator DeSanto, Senator Sharif. Um, I have some experience with testimony, so it's not too intimidating, but yes, happy to make this an informal educational session. Um, just give me one moment to start sharing my screen so I can have some slides. This stuff's always so much easier when there's some um, visual representations of the, the way these systems are designed. So um, someone give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen all right. Awesome. So the presentation today will be a 101. It'll be a basics um, because even though these technologies are now um, approaching about 10, 11 years old, uh, they're still very complicated tools that are only now beginning to see widespread use. So just like the internet in say 1995, just basic information about how they work is not actually that common. And yet it's very important as both of um, both of you senators mentioned with respect to forming good policy so that we can grow the economy, but also protect consumers and users of the technology. So briefly, I want to um, start just by telling you who I am. Uh, so uh, you know who you're listening to. Coin Center is an independent nonprofit research and advocacy organization. And uh, as was said, we're based in Washington, DC. And we exist for one purpose, and that's to make sure that policymakers um, in federal government, in state governments, and sometimes abroad, have the information they need about how the technology works so they can set good policy from a place of knowledge rather than making uh, mistaken or poor policy from a place of ignorance. And we focus on education about cryptocurrency and open blockchain technologies. And so these are things like uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum, um, you may have heard of various different cryptocurrencies. Um, we'll get into a little bit of, about what makes these what we call open blockchain networks. They're shared resources um, rather than permissioned or private blockchain technologies. Um, and we'll talk about that later on in this presentation. We've had um, multiple opportunities to testify before Congress and brief EU Parliament and other members of policymaking circles. Uh, we have a full-time professional staff with three lawyers on the team, and we've been doing this since 2014. Um, so we work with Congress, as I said, state governments do some work internationally. We've worked extensively with Treasury and the SEC to formulate good policy. As Senator Sharif said, one question is whether this is a commodity or whether some of these things might be treated as securities and regulated as such or traded on those those markets. We do what we do because we believe strongly that open blockchain networks like Bitcoin are new public goods. Just like the internet itself is a public good, it's this shared and unowned technological resource that anyone can access. Um, so too is Bitcoin. So too is Ethereum, Zcash, even Dogecoin. <laughs> And just as the internet needs and deserves independent advocates um, like the Electronic Frontier Foundation and the Center for Democracy and Technology who will represent the technology um, exclusively rather than represent the interests of big business uh, to folks in government, open blockchain networks deserve that kind of independent nonprofit advocacy as well. And it's Coin Center's mission to rep that tech to government. And it's that shared public quality, that public good quality that has always drawn me to cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. And it's the part of the technology that I really want to focus on when I explain it uh, in this presentation today. So it's important to start with sort of dispelling some myths. Um, people talk about Bitcoin being innovative for a number of reasons, and sometimes they're not actually accurate. So. Bitcoin is not innovative because it's privately issued currency. Uh, we've actually had privately issued currency for large swaths of history. Um, banknotes for many parts of the US history were, were actually printed by banks, uh, private banks. And Bitcoin's also not actually innovative because it's so-called digital money. Um, PayPal and Venmo and these modern app-based money transmitters aside, even regular old bank money like at BBVA or Bank of America has been digital for decades because they use computers to keep track of balances. 
And Bitcoin is also not innovative because it has a blockchain or digital signatures. So the, the math and science of signature crypto systems, for example, and blockchains, as in a specific type of data structure, all that computer science has actually existed for decades. Um, this is a formative paper that was published in 1976 on some of the digital signatures that make Bitcoin uh, possible. Bitcoin built on these older innovations. And Bitcoin is also not innovative because it's a uh, it's got a blockchain that is somehow a better database for storing important information. You'll sometimes hear that you know Bitcoin's just a big spreadsheet, but it's better. It's actually a fairly costly and inefficient database as compared with products like Oracle or S3 that have been around for for years since the 1970s. So why is Bitcoin innovative? This is the most important question. In my opinion, Bitcoin is innovative because it is a network of free and independent people across the world who work together to provide a service that previously could only be economically provided by a corporation or other centralized, centrally planned organization. So it's a group of people who've been able to come together using software and technology to do something that previously could only be done by a company or a government. And that thing that these people are coming together to do is money transmission. It's the ability to move something of value from one place in the world to the other electronically. So pre-Bitcoin, if you wanted to give money or any kind of item of value to another person, you would really only have two choices. You can meet in person and hand them something of value, probably cash like US dollars, or you can use a trustworthy company like PayPal, and they'll move your money for you, or a bank for that matter. When I first created this slide, PayPal was a little skeptical of Bitcoin. Um, but as it turns out, now you can buy and sell Bitcoin on PayPal. So I've updated it. And if you're not going to use one company to move your money for you, say like a PayPal, you're going to rely on a network of companies like the correspondent banking system to manage the transfer. And these technologies are ancient. Uh, correspondent banking has been going on for centuries. And even today, with innovations like Fedwire and Swift, these transfers still sometimes take two to three days. And we can do better. Um, text messages can fly across the internet in a matter of seconds. So why not money too? And so as I said, Bitcoin allowed a network of individual people to provide electronic money transmission as a service without relying on any particular participant or coordinating central planner. So you don't have to trust any of those people on the network individually. You just have to trust that when they work together as a system, you can rely on it for sending money from one person to another, from one place to another around the world. As we say in the cryptocurrency community, it's sort of the ethos of Bitcoin that we should be able to have money on the internet that doesn't necessarily rely on any particular government, doesn't rely on any particular company, and doesn't rely on any trusted third party. The goal is to have shared computing infrastructure in between us, just software that anyone can download onto their computer for free, peer-to-peer -peer networks for exchanging that information between people running that software, and a little bit of game theory to make it all work. And we'll get into why people choose to participate in these networks. What are the incentives? What are the controls that prevent people from behaving badly when they're helping people move money across the Bitcoin network? And it's really about you and me. Uh, ideally, this should be a money by the people for the people. So what we're really doing at heart is taking everything that PayPal would do as a centralized company and breaking it down into simple technological activities that can be performed by a group of people who are connected on the internet rather than a centralized company that's incorporated and has a profit motive and things like that. So how do we decentralize PayPal? It's first helpful to just ask, what does PayPal do? Well, everyone pretty much understands PayPal at this point. You can put some money into PayPal, connect your bank to it or something like that. And you can tell PayPal, hey, I want to send this money to my friend, Bob, and PayPal will send the money to Bob. And now Bob has it, and I don't have it. 
And this is a foundational important thing with our digital economy is to be able to pay somebody, say a merchant online when we want to buy something. Now, what is PayPal really doing? We can break it down into three basic activities. The first thing is user onboarding or account creation. Um, this is pretty straightforward. Uh, they keep track of their customers. They know the balances of their customers and they allow their customers to log in. So you only should be allowed to move your money on PayPal if you can prove that you have the password. And so they create a username for you and a password and you log in. And hopefully you secure that password well, or someone might be able to move the balances of your PayPal account without your permission. They do accounting and record keeping, just as a bank would do accounting and record keeping. They keep track of who sent money to who, and they've made sure that I can't send more money than I've actually received or, or have in my account in the past. I can't overdraw, if you will. And then the third thing that PayPal does is there's a management or oversight function within the corporation. And this is the team that watches the two other teams that makes sure that the team that's doing user onboarding and account creation is creating you know, a robust login and password system so that there's no cybersecurity vulnerabilities. The team that oversees accounting and record keeping to make sure that there's no funny money being created, that we're just moving money around and not, you know, artificially inflating the supply of dollars on PayPal or something like that. And the management or oversight team is the, the capitalist, if you will. They run the business, and if the business does well, they profit. And if the business um, is not performing well, if they're making mistakes with these other functions, they're um, going to suffer losses. So they're motivated to make sure this whole thing runs correctly. Now, how can we take all that, all that stuff that PayPal does and spread it out amongst a bunch of independent individuals who are running computers on the internet, who are running software. Because that's basically, again, what Bitcoin does. It allows these individuals to do something that previously could have only been done by a corporation. And it allows them to do that such that it works without you having to trust any one of them. Um, because you have to trust PayPal to move your money around. And we don't want a system where you have to trust some rando like, um, my uncle who lives in his basement in Florida to move money around. So if he's a member of the Bitcoin network, we need to make sure that he can participate to make the service work, but you don't have to trust Chris Crozier uh, down in Florida necessarily, unless you want to. So we've got these folks on the network and they're just running software on computers and anyone can download this software just like anyone can download an app for their, their smartphone. And the computers are networked together just like any computers on the net, on the internet might be networked together. It's, it's all over the internet, uh, just like the Zoom meeting right now. So how do they work together to perform that first function where we're creating usernames for people and we're checking passwords so that if I'm sending money through the Bitcoin network, it's always me, not someone pretending to be me. Well, we take that user onboarding function and we turn it into something that's basically pure math. It's called public key cryptography. We don't need to get into the details of how that math works, but basically you get a matching uh, pair of keys, a public key and a private key. And the public key is your username, just like you might have a username for PayPal. And the private key is your password. And what you can do using your computer when you connect to the network is create a mathematical message using your private key. The message is going to be a digital signature. And because this is just math, it's math that's been around since the 1970s, as I said earlier, anyone else with a computer, even a pretty modestly powered computer, can check that that digital signature is valid and could only have been created by the person who has the private key. And so this is how me, as one particular user sending money across the Bitcoin network, can make a statement using my computer that everyone else on the network knows is true. Peter is the one who's asking money to be sent across the network, not someone impersonating him. That's assuming I've secured that password, that private key. But that's the same as we assume that people secure their PayPal passwords well, because if they don't, we run into problems. So everyone on the network can check that username and login, the same credentials that their team at PayPal would be doing in order to provide me money transmission services. What about this accounting record keeping feature where 
we keep track of who sent money to who to make sure that people aren't sending more money than they have and to make sure that people who receive money have actually received it and everyone knows that that's their balance now as opposed to their previous balance which might have been zero before this accounting and record keeping function is again something we need everyone on the network to partake in so that we don't have to trust one person on the network to do it for us because the whole point is to obviate the need for a trusted third party, is to work together as a shared community to move money. This is where so-called blockchain technology comes in. And the only thing you need to know about blockchain technology is that it's just a way of displaying data that is easily auditable. So it's easy for everyone who has a copy of the list of transactions, the accounting, the records for who sent money to who, to be able to validate the data and say, yes, this transaction happened at this point in the past, and then this transaction happened after it. And I can run functions against this data using my computer, and I can trust that this data is valid. But we all work together to share this data. We'll get into a little bit more detail later about that. So it doesn't sound like magic, hopefully. And then the final question is, if everyone's keeping track of the records, and if everyone is opening accounts for users and checking the the public key cryptography, who provides the management or oversight function? Who's the, who's the capitalist, the Elon Musk or Peter Thiel to PayPal? Who's the person who's incentivized to make the system work well and to make sure that everyone's doing their job? Well, with Bitcoin, there is no capitalist. There actually is no um, person on the network with the authority to oversee everything, to make sure that everything's running. Well, and that's because when everyone's performing these functions and when these functions are reduced to verifiable math, to numbers that add up on everyone's computers and everyone can check each other, you don't really have employees in the traditional sense. You don't have an employee of the month. You just have everyone working together to make the system work. And we don't need to worry about their performance because if they try and do anything that is against the rules of the system, the math will simply not work out and their contribution to the system will be automatically ignored. And then why do people do this? Why do people perform these mathematical calculations to allow this system to work? Well, they do it because they're also allowed in the rules of the system to give themselves a reward and they can compete for that reward by performing more work for the network you can earn more Bitcoins, which are the currency of that network. And so people just do this because they want to they want to earn that profit. And this all sounds crazy, I know, and it is. But for about 11 years now, it works. Just like with PayPal, if you have some Bitcoins, because maybe you've received them from someone else on the network, or you bought them from a company like Coinbase who sells them for dollars, if you have those Bitcoins, Using nothing but your computer, you can send them to somebody else on the Bitcoin network without having to trust any particular person in between, just like you can send a message over the internet person to person. And that's pretty miraculous. And we'll get into why that's important in a little bit. So what's key to remember here is what we've done is taken a service like PayPal or Venmo, and we've turned it into sort of commoditized money transmission. You know, a commodity is something that anyone can provide. It's not a unique, non-fungible service like PayPal's very specific money transmission service or Venmo's very specific money transmission service. A commoditized service is just something that doesn't matter where the commodity came from. Corn is corn, wheat is wheat, gold is gold. Bitcoin makes money transmission money transmission. It just works on the internet and it's all the same. And as a brief diversion, because I think it's really fascinating. There's an amazing economist, um, formerly of, he's deceased now, sadly, but formerly of the Chicago School of Economics, University of Chicago, who wrote about how, um, you know, when do you need firms to do something in the economy and when can markets of competing providers like commodities providers do something in the market? And Ronald Coase said, look, capitalism is great as far as a way of organizing scarce resources in the economy. But sometimes it's not always ideal to use a market to organize scarce resources. And that's because markets can have transaction costs. And so when you have transaction costs and when they're high, 
you're going to want a sort of an island of socialism, an island of central control to actually plan and provide the service. And so this is Coase's notion of the firm. You're going to create a firm to do something like money transmission because they can reduce the costs of otherwise relying on a market of providers to do that money transmission. So when you have high transaction costs because the goods are unique and hard to price, when you have multiple market interactions, contracting costs, you've got to reestablish a relationship every time you want to move money, something like that. Um, when you have longer term and uncertain work that's desired, um, say like a long-term banking relationship with a lot of questions as to what, what the long-term scope of work will be, you're going to want a company to do it for you. You're going to want a firm. You're not going to want to go to the market every time. And so that's why PayPal made sense in a world where money transmission has high transaction costs. When we need to check that the usernames and passwords are being created um, well, that the records are being kept, going to a market every time for that of independent providers would have high transaction costs. You'd have to establish a new relationship every time. But when we routinize these tasks and make them into math, which is, again, what the Bitcoin protocol does, it reduces the transaction costs. And maybe we no longer need this firm to do that particular thing. We can rely on an open market of free and associated participants to perform that function. And Coase actually predicted this all the way back when he wrote his paper. Um, he said, you know, if transaction costs decrease, we'll see markets provide services. Um, if transaction costs increase, we'll see firms grow in size and singular um, uh, centralized providers. And so Bitcoin can be thought of just a way to reduce the transaction costs of moving money such that now a market of participants across the world can do it rather than a sort of um, centralized uh, single participant or, or, or provider. Again, it's about people, not companies, providing a service. So I want to get into a couple more details so that Again, this technology that allows people to send money um, for each other rather than a central company that makes this sound a little less like magic. So the first is that accounting record keeping part, that, that blockchain part. If everyone's going to keep a copy of the ledger, keep a copy of the blockchain on that network, we get some benefits. So the first is just redundancy. If um, one person on the network is going to be evil, I'm going to try and manipulate that record so that it shows that they have a lot more money than they actually have, well, it'll be immediately apparent because their record won't match up with everyone else's. And the blockchain is, again, this data structure that allows that kind of check, does your record match my record, to be done really easily and quickly. And another benefit of distributing the ledger is sort of disaster recovery. And this was the original idea behind the internet, uh, having all these computers networked together we don't have to worry if we lose some computers, we can still communicate with each other because it's a peer-to-peer -peer network instead of a sort of hub and spoke network where if the hub goes out, all the spokes are screwed, not to put too fine a point on it. So Bitcoin's great in this sense in that there's thousands of copies of the Bitcoin blockchain around the world, tens of thousands at least, um, redundantly stored on computers in hundreds of different countries around the world at this point as well. The other thing I want to say about blockchains is in my stylized representation of a blockchain here, I've got sort of dates and times. You know, Alice sent this Bitcoin to Bob at this time. Jane sent this Bitcoin to Francis at this time, et cetera, et cetera. And a typical, you know, accounting spreadsheet would have a sort of date and time field, right? The Bitcoin blockchain doesn't have to trust somebody to provide the time. I know this sounds a little funny, but the truth is there's no authoritative timekeeper in the world. I mean, there's several that you could choose to trust if you wanted to, like the US Geological Survey or some other um, major entity that keeps an atomic clock or something like that. But again, with Bitcoin, we don't want to trust anybody in particular. We want to trust the network as a whole. So we wouldn't want that weak point where we have to trust one time provider. And so this is an interesting thing about blockchains is they don't really have an absolute time per transaction. But we do know, because of the way the math works, that some transactions happen before other transactions. And that's because transactions are bundled into these things called blocks. And this is why it's called a blockchain. And blocks come in order. And when I made this presentation, we were at block 516,000. We're way higher than that now. Um, 
So these blocks are all in order. You know, you get 516,455, and then you get block 500,016,456. <laughs> and we know that the transactions in the more recent blocks, the one there on the right of my stylized image, came after the blocks before, because there's this piece of data in the more recent blocks. It's that thing that says hash of 516,456 in that last block. It's a piece of data that could only have been produced by a computer using the input of the previous block. Take that data, run it through what's called a hash function, and out comes a hash. And because we see that hash there, we know that the transactions alongside this hash could have only happened after the transactions in the previous block. And so this allows us to know that transactions in earlier blocks happened before transactions in later blocks. And that order of payments is important because if I was to pay one senator and then pay the other senator, we'd want to know who was paid first in case I don't have enough money to pay the second time. And so Bitcoin keeps track of this by creating this hash-linked blockchain, bundles of transactions. And we know that some transactions happened after other ones because of this hash function. And so every block references the previous blocks. This is why they're all chained together. Computing that hash function, taking all that data and creating a hash can be made very difficult. And so this is a way that we can actually have members of the network compete to be the next person in this group of people to create the next block. We wouldn't want one person on the network always having the power to create the next block because then we'd be trusting them. And the whole point is to not have to trust people. The whole point is to work together. And so this is what we do. Everyone on the network who's running a computer that's running the full Bitcoin software chooses to run this hash function. And they, they're trying, they're competing with each other. They're trying to be the first person to calculate the next hash function. And one inevitably will be the first. It's kind of like a guess and check. Like you could try, you could try to plug this number in. You could try to plug this number in. Eventually, someone's going to pick the right number, kind of like a lottery, and they'll be able to create the hash. And everyone else will be able to check that that hash is valid. Again, this is just a mathematical function. It's like checking your, your kid's homework when they're in algebra class. Yep, those numbers add up. And that's when the network then agrees, yep, that's the next block in the blockchain. Without having to trust any particular person, we just know that this person did the math and did the math correctly. And so there was a question earlier about energy usage. And yes, Bitcoin does, um, does use energy. It uses energy to calculate these hashes. And different people on the network will try and dedicate more computing resources to calculating this hash because they want to be the person to write the next block and they're in competition with everyone else to do it faster than everyone else. And so there is this race to use more energy to create more hash power to create the next block to win this sort of contest between all of the miners. And you can look at that as, you know, a dangerous use of energy. Um, but I think that's actually wrong. We want people to invest in resources to make this network work. And so that electricity is not going to nothing. It's going to robustly securing the blockchain against, say, somebody on the network who would try to forge blocks and create invalid transactions. We want to make it costly to participate. And we want a fair mechanism of competition between people to participate. And making it costly in the form of electricity that you need to pay for um, imposes those costs and therefore adds to the security of the Bitcoin blockchain. The next thing I want to talk about is this user onboarding and authentication function. So again, we've got our stylized Bitcoin block here. Now, in my sort of easy to learn version, we've got human readable names in it. These are some people that I know in the crypto space that you might recognize some of their names, like Vitalik, who started Ethereum. This is just my idea of a joke. Sorry, it's not funny. <laughs> the real Bitcoin blockchain, of course, does not have human readable names in it. Instead, when you decide you want to keep Bitcoin on your smartphone, for example, your smartphone will run the Bitcoin software and it will create addresses 
And these addresses are just long strings of letters and numbers that are unique to you. And your phone will also create that private key for you, which is that password. And that data is being created and kept on your phone. It's not something you're trusting a company to provide you. It's really just happening on your phone. And the person who you want to pay will also have these addresses created and they'll have these private keys, which are their passwords for them to send money in the future. And so when someone sends money to someone else on the Bitcoin blockchain, we don't see the names. We see the Bitcoin addresses, these random looking but unique strings of letters and numbers sending Bitcoins to other random looking but unique strings of letters and numbers. And we also see the digital signature that could have only been created using the smartphone that has the private key on it, the password, if you will. And that, that signature is something that everybody on the network will receive. When I want to send money to someone else, that message, my address is sending to this person's address, and this is the signature from my address, will be looked at by everyone else on the network, and the math of that signature can be checked. And again, this is why we don't have to trust any particular person on the network, because the math adds up. We know that this is a bona fide transfer from me to someone else and not fraud. Now, you might be saying, I'm really concerned about storing Bitcoin on my smartphone because I lose my smartphone. And does that mean if I lose my smartphone, I lose that private key and I lose my Bitcoins? Yes, it does. So if you are going to keep your money on your smartphone, you're using what we sometimes call a software wallet. And basically, I keep the key on my phone. I use some software that was written by a, an innovative company. We were talking about jobs policy earlier. Um, a lot of these companies specialize in writing software and they employ people to do that so that people can use that software to use the Bitcoin network. So maybe I'm keeping the key on my phone and I use the key to move money around on the public Bitcoin network. That's a software wallet. And yes, it has consumer protection concerns in the sense that you want to make sure people are educated. And if they're really going to choose to hold their Bitcoin directly on their own smartphone, they understand that they're taking that risk. Just as it would be a risk to walk around with $1,000 in your wallet in your pocket, it's a risk to walk around with $1,000 on your smartphone when you hold the keys directly. Um, if you lose your wallet, you're not getting your dollars back. And if you lose your smartphone, it's the same. It's like digital cash. You won't be getting your Bitcoin back. But this is not the only way to hold Bitcoin. You can work with a company. Uh, I have a neutral company here because I don't want to necessarily um, promote any particular one, but you've probably heard of several of them. These are companies like Coinbase or Kraken or Gemini. There's lots of them. And these companies will, um, if you want, hold your Bitcoin keys for you. And so then they're like a Bitcoin bank. And you might say, well, that sounds like it goes against the basic idea of Bitcoin, where we're going to have individuals provide the service rather than a central service provider, um, where we're going to have no trust in any particular party. Here we do have trust. We have a company that's holding people's Bitcoin for them. And this is, you know, a trade-off. What's great about Bitcoin is it allows either. It allows people who don't want to trust a company to hold directly and maybe have more privacy because of that or more freedom, uh, especially if they live in an oppressive regime overseas, perhaps. But if they don't want to hold their own Bitcoin, they can hire a company and the company will secure those private keys for them. And that's what we sometimes call a hosted wallet. There's also a fun hybrid that Bitcoin makes possible. Because this Bitcoin network is programmatic money in a way, we can divide control between multiple parties. And so sometimes we refer to multi-sig wallets. So in a multi-sig wallet, a company might hold one key and provide me with software that allows me to generate and hold two other keys. And then the Bitcoin network has this transaction type called a multi-sig transaction. And that multi-sig transaction can be specified as a voting rule, just like you might have in the Pennsylvania Senate. If this money is going to pass, it's going to need two out of three of these keys to write a digital signature. And so this creates a really interesting uh, new business model, a very innovative business model, where the wallet provider in this case, the multi-sig provider, only has one out of three keys. They can't move my money without my consent and, and control uh, I can move my money independently because I have two keys out of three. Maybe I keep one on my smartphone and I keep one in my sock drawer in case I ever lose my smartphone. Now, if I lose my smartphone, I don't lose my Bitcoin because I can go to my sock drawer, get my key and call up the multi-sig wallet provider and say, hey, we need to sign together to move the money to a new safe account because I lost the smartphone. 
But interestingly, if the multi-sig wallet company goes out of business or was corrupted in some way or hacked, they can never steal my money on, my, on their own because I control the other two keys. This is a really innovative business. Um, and it's a, one of the more exciting things about Bitcoin, honestly. The final thing is this management oversight function. Like I said, there's, there's no capitalist in the Bitcoin network. Everyone is simply competing with each other to provide the service rather than working for some particular um, management or, or uh, uh, board of directors or CEO or what you will. Why do people do this? Why do people perform all this work, um, keeping the blockchain, checking the digital signatures? What drives them? Well, as I said, they can give themselves a reward. Uh, the Bitcoin network describes a certain number of Bitcoins. You've probably heard that there's only ever going to be 21 million Bitcoins. And that's true. And that's because rules in the software say every time you create a block, if you're a miner, you can create some brand new Bitcoins. And in the beginning of the network, a miner was allowed to create a block with 50 brand new Bitcoins in it. But the way the software was written, every four years or so, the amount that a miner can give themselves cuts in half. So it was 50, then it was 25, 12.5, soon it'll be 6.25, down and down and down to nothing. So eventually there'll be no new Bitcoins. And if you do the math on that release schedule, you come out with 21 million Bitcoins total. And the interesting thing about this is that if a miner tries to give themselves more Bitcoins than the, than the rules of the software allow, when they broadcast that block to the rest of the network, the rest of the network will check that and say, you weren't allowed to give yourselves those extra Bitcoins. And so the block would be invalid. They would have done all that work for nothing. But if they did give themselves the right amount, they'll be able to claim that as a reward for their participation in the network, for providing this public good of a decentralized money transmission. Now, you might say, well, if eventually miners aren't allowed to give themselves new Bitcoins because the supply is capped, why will miners participate? Why will they be creating the blockchain and checking the signatures? And that's, that's because miners are also allowed to give themselves any fees that people who want their transaction in a block voluntarily append to their transaction. So you can write a Bitcoin transaction that doesn't have a fee. It's just like, I want to send this money to this person and I'm not giving a fee to anyone. And that could get included in a block, but the space in a block is scarce and miners will choose which transactions they want to put in their block. And so there's a competitive market that emerges for people to put a competitive fee under their transaction. And then uh, the miner can claim that fee when they successfully mine that block. And so that's what will continue to incentivize miners to work into the future. If there's a lot of demand for the Bitcoin network, people will voluntarily need to append fees for their transactions to be included in blocks. And those fees will be rewards for miners. And the last thing I want to say about Bitcoin is why? <laughs> why Bitcoins? Why not just move dollars around? Because that's the big difference here is PayPal, of course, is moving people's dollar balances around. With Bitcoin, we're moving these weird things called Bitcoins that, you know, they're like a scarce commodity. There's only 21 million of them. And so if people want to buy them, there's only so many to buy. Supply and demand with scarcity means there'll be a price. Why couldn't we build this system just with dollars instead of Bitcoins? Well, the answer is that if you're going to have dollars described on the ledger, then you're going to have to have somebody who has a bank account and make sure that the dollars described on the Bitcoin ledger equal the dollars in some you know, trusted entity like a bank. And so that reintroduces trust into the system. And this is not the goal of the system. We do have stable coins, which could be a topic for a future briefing. It's a whole nother topic in cryptocurrency. Stable coins are these digital tokens that are transferable on peer-to-peer -peer networks like Bitcoin, but they're backed by somebody who has a bank account and has dollars in that bank account. But then you have to trust that person. You get the benefits of a more stable currency, a dollar, something like that. But you get the trade-off of having to trust the person who's keeping that bank account and make sure that they're being honest. Both of these are good innovations. My point is just that Bitcoin has to have this unique unit in order to work without trust. And so it's not just because people on the internet are weird. Um, it's because we had to create a new unit of currency in order to have a truly decentralized, trustless ledger. 
And that's this native asset called Bitcoin. The last thing I want to say is, why is there this focus on no government, no company, no trusted third party? You might think these people sound like uh, sort of fringe lunatics who want to live in the mountains and stockpile canned goods. Honestly, for most people, these things don't matter very much. Because in the US, we live in a pretty functional system where the government does pretty good. Companies are actually pretty trustworthy. We've got the rule of law. We've, we, we don't mind trusting third parties in the US. And that's why I think most people will continue to make payments using credit cards and banks and companies like PayPal. But the fact of the matter is that's not true everywhere. And trusting a company to make all your payments for you has risks. So for example, there's lots of digital payments being made in China nowadays that are kind of like Bitcoin payments. They're kind of like, you know, you see a QR code, which is that little, that little thing on the lunch table there. And you take a picture of it with your phone and you send the money to the restaurant. The problem with this is if you're going to do all of your e-commerce, this is somebody um, playing music in an alleyway and taking donations in China using WeChat and Alipay. If you're going to trust WeChat and Alipay for things like medical services, someone paying for medical services, for things like uh, buying books, then these big companies are going to know who you are, what you read, if you're sick. And in the case of China with Alipay and WeChat, the Chinese government will know all those details about you as well. And this is even more the case with the new Chinese digital currency called DCEP, which is being developed, where the government, the Communist Party of China, will have all of the details of all of your payments using that digital currency. No privacy. And they're going to use that information to rate everyone. This is the so-called social credit score. And you won't be able to opt out. And if your score is low, then you might not be able to travel abroad anymore or use high-speed rail. This is already something we see in China. And if your account gets locked in a world without cash, where now all payments are electronic and we trust somebody to make those payments, having your account locked is really like being cut off from economic life. This is even more true in parts of the world where paper currency is disappearing, where people aren't using cash anymore or governments don't want there to be cash anymore. You'll have no last resort. You'll have to trust the company. And if the company or the government, if it's a government run company, decides that you shouldn't be transacting anymore, then you can't transact anymore. And the thing I want to say about this in general is that relying on a private intermediary or a government-run intermediary to punish via payments censorship, cutting people off from the payment system in a world without physical cash, it can't easily be reconciled with the rule of law. And that's because we have this idea in the, in the US and in many nations that you should only be punished if you were violating a crime and if you were found guilty by a jury of your peers, if you will. And simply cutting people off from access to the financial system in the way that these payment intermediaries might do in parts of the world is usually not done through a court of law. It's never done through a court of law. It's done through arbitrary power by the people who are in between the service providers who allow you to send money or in certain situations don't. So two quick examples. In Belarus, where we've seen pro-democracy protests this past year in 2020, we saw a nonprofit BISOL that found that it was impossible to sponsor peaceful pro democracy advocates who perhaps had been fired from their government job because they were protesting. It was impossible to sponsor them using the traditional financial services, using banks and traditional money transmitters. And they turned to Bitcoin as the only alternative that worked because there wasn't this choke point in the middle, this company that had to be trusted. And they were able to sponsor pro-democracy, um, peaceful pro-democracy advocates to the tune of $3 million in 2020. And in 2020, we also saw in Nigeria a, um, a nonprofit called Feminist Coalition, which was protesting police violence in that country, who were cut off from the financial system and still were able to raise an additional 40% of their total donations to stop police violence using Bitcoin. And so I'm going to close on this. Uh, we're about at time. 
the point that we want to get across from you know Coin Center is yeah, these technologies are novel and sometimes scary and different and sometimes strange, but they do something very important. Only digital cash systems like Bitcoin preserve a free and open alternative that can't be taken away by the most corrupt government or the most unscrupulous corporation. And that's why these technologies matter and why they're important to our future. Um, we don't necessarily need all our transactions to be peer to peer. We can still have trusted institutions, but we should always have this ability to fall back to a free and open system for moving money so that we're not at the whim of totalitarians or unscrupulous corporations. So in short, free and open payment technologies enable liberal values, open societies. And if that's interesting, we've got a whole report on it written by my, uh, my colleague, Jerry Brito. So thank you for your time. I hope this has answered a number of your questions that were presented at the start to me. Uh, and if we have any time, I'm happy to take any additional questions. Yeah, we have, we have a couple minutes. Uh, Caitlin, did you get any questions in or I have one or two I, I'd like to ask or Senator Sharif? Uh, go ahead, Senator Santo. So I, I guess I think that's a good uh, basic outline, but I'm not still clear on how the governor's decisions are made to update the Bitcoin protocol. You know, who must agree or what level of consensus is required to institute any changes to that and how could that potentially you know relate into regulatory uh, issues which may be a whole nother presentation i know this is a big topic and we just <laughs> kind of got to the basics that's a fantastic question and you're right it could easily be the subject of a whole nother presentation governance is one of those things in the cryptocurrency community that there isn't widespread agreement on i will say with bitcoin to take one example, and there are several cryptocurrencies, all with their own unique set of rules, their own unique set of software. But with Bitcoin, there are several independent contributors, thousands, in fact, who have looked at the open source software. You can find it on multiple places on the internet. It's, it's just computer code, but it's stored in lots of different places. You can look at it, you can say, I don't know if this function is efficient. Wouldn't it be more efficient to rewrite this computer code this way? Or I don't know if I like the features. I think it should be more private. Um, maybe the digital signatures should be harder to route back to an actual person. Um, and so that way the blockchain wouldn't give away personal information as freely. You can imagine all of these changes to the software. And so that's the core of that governance decision that you're talking about. Like, when do we decide that this should be part of Bitcoin or should not be part of Bitcoin, that it should have this feature or not that? And it is a loose and community oriented process. Anyone can propose a change to the software, but the thing that will ultimately determine what Bitcoin is, is whether participants on the network decide to upgrade their software with that change. And these tend to be very conservative folks, um, not in the political sense, just in the, they don't wanna change the protocol because they're invested in the protocol. And so it actually doesn't change very often. There are other cryptocurrency projects where there's a faster and looser sort of perspective. We want to innovate. We want to really create new features. And those projects do change more often. But it really is a sort of consent of the network situation where the only way Bitcoin changes is if everyone agrees to update their software. And so the inertia there generally provides a, a good measure of security and comfort that this thing won't change in a way that would be detrimental to users. We only have about six minutes. I don't, Senator Street, do you have anything? Or I have another question. I, I just want to offer you the opportunity. Well, you can go ahead and then I'll offer mine. Um, you know, it's very disconcerting towards the end of your, your presentation about the Chinese Bitcoin and how the government controls and everything. And, and I remember I first became aware of Bitcoin when Silk Road was happening and all the illicit activity. So wh what can be done to, you know, protect yourself from the Chinese money and also to target illicit activity conducted on cryptocurrencies? So to be very clear, what China is working on now is not Bitcoin. Um, the Chinese government has developed its own digital currency. Um, it's often referred to as DCEP, D-C-E-P. I'm blanking at the moment on what those letters stand for, but you can Google it and find out more. 
DCEP is not a cryptocurrency. It's a centralized digital currency. And the vision that they have is that transactions can be made using DCEP from one Chinese citizen to another or internationally, potentially. And the banks in China will not be able to see the details of those transactions. But the central bank, the, the federal government in China, if you will, the Communist Party of China, will be able to see all of those details. And so you can look at this in a couple ways. You can look at this as a country doing something good from an innovation standpoint, creating a digital currency that will hopefully streamline and make more efficient payments within, the, within their borders. But I think it's, it's very worth looking at this skeptically and saying, is this just a mass surveillance tool? Is this just a way to have greater control over their population to prevent, um, to prevent dissent, to prevent um, regime change, things like that? And so I'm very wary of the DCEP project. I think it could be good technology, but this is why I believe we need things like Bitcoin to protect ourselves against potentially surveillance enabling, um, controlling enabling tools like new digital currencies from potentially totalitarian regimes. As far as um, the Silk Road, the fact of the matter is when you have something that's digital cash and Bitcoin is really a digital cash, it will be used like cash. And you know it would be silly to deny that people use cash to buy drugs. That's simply a fact. Um, and people will use digital cash to buy drugs. What's worth noting is that first, we don't actually see more illicit transactions in Bitcoin as digital cash than we do in physical cash. Most illicit transactions are still being made using physical cash. So there's nothing especially wrong on the Bitcoin network. And the second thing to point out is in order to obtain Bitcoin, you're going to need to go to a company like Coinbase or Kraken. And these are regulated companies that have to know their customers and report suspicious activities. And so the on-ramps and off-ramps of this system are still places where we can apply reasonable anti-money laundering precautions to prevent the spread of criminal funds. Great, Senator Sharif, you haven't, or <laughs> Senator Street, I keep saying Sharif, I'm sorry, so. <laughs> It's fine. Sharif Street, I'm both my names. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> no problem, Senator. Uh, look, I I, I, uh, I agree. I mean, I first um, encountered uh, discussions around Bitcoin around some of the, the, the activity on the dark web. And I think that's a that's that's a perception. I think you're going to hear from a lot of lawmakers. But I've also heard a lot from um, uh, young entrepreneurs who are really into it now. Um, a lot of the, uh, I represent Temple University and a lot of the, the young people who are recent grads or, or college students are really into it. Um, so there is, a, there is another space where it's growing. Um, I would just, just question, so um, where do you see the future of Bitcoin going? Is it more like a commodity or do you think it'll be treated more like an actual currency? Um, it sort of sits in the middle, somewhere between. Um, and as a government, ultimately, you know, uh, whether it's the state government or federal government, we regulate things. That's kind of what we do. Um, where do you, if we were going to do, if we're going to put some some guardrails up, should those guardrails be thinking about it like a commodity or thinking about it like a currency? It's an excellent question, uh, Senator Street. So. Bitcoin behaves like a commodity. And so just as for, if we're going to go through a classificatory exercise, the fact that there's only 21 million means it's this scarce thing. Um, and very much like gold in that sense, there's only so much of it. God isn't making any more of it, as you might say. And so it will be traded uh, as a scarce valuable commodity to the extent it's traded at all. And so uh, supervising and policing those commodities like markets for fraud and manipulation is certainly a role um, that governments should and do play. And then the other thing is um, basic money transmission licensing. So the companies that help people secure their own Bitcoin, if people don't want to secure it themselves, uh, you know, if you want to keep your Bitcoin with a company, you're basically banking your Bitcoin. So in this case, it is behaving more like a currency. You're you're trusting somebody to hold your money, your currency. Those companies, it is completely reasonable, and this is what we do in Pennsylvania and in many other states across the union, uh, to require that if someone's going to be in that position of trust where they're holding other people's Bitcoins, that they get a money transmission license, they prove that they have minimum capitalization, 
that they're not hypothecating or spreading the Bitcoin around in risky investments, that they get criminal background checks, all the things that we would normally require from a PayPal or a Venmo. And then you mentioned um, innovation and what is it? I don't mean to be infuriating, but there's a way to talk about Bitcoin where it's neither a currency or a commodity. And it's a lot of what I've been saying in this presentation throughout. It's an open platform. Um, yes, there's this scarce resource that's moved around on this open platform and it's a Bitcoin and it's got value. But the thing that's really important to us uh, is just like the internet protocols were open platforms, the Bitcoin protocol is an open platform. So like you said, you see lots of young people at universities getting interested in how the software works and ultimately building on top of it. Because just like the internet, you can build a website on top of the internet. You can build an application for a smartphone that uses the internet for communications throughput. You can build applications and websites and new innovative tools that build on top of the Bitcoin blockchain. They might use the internet for communications, an open protocol, protocol for communications under them, and they might use the Bitcoin blockchain for sharing trusted, trusted bits of information where you want to make sure that this is the right piece of information. And so that could be trusted like, I know that I've been paid this money. I go to the Bitcoin blockchain for that and I build my application on top of Bitcoin because I want to leverage that trust. Or it could be things like identity. We can put identity information into the Bitcoin blockchain. Just as you carry a wallet that has cash in it, your wallet also has a driver's license. If we anchored some of that information about that identity document in a blockchain, in an open permissionless blockchain, we could actually have much better assurances that yes, this driver's license was issued at this date and time by this institution. Or yes, this college degree was issued at this date and time by this institution. And this person is the rightful holder of it. So we could have a digital identity ecosystem that also doesn't necessarily need to rely on trusted third parties, um, which can obviously be hacked and are hacked all the time in the identity context. And so, you know, these are just novel use cases. I bring up the identity one because it's one novel use case that can emerge when we have this open platform for innovation that any college kid or even younger can just start playing with and building things on top of. Yeah, uh, one thing I just want to center if I can one, one final. Um, 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 and it, the one thing I would say is a little different than the internet, where the internet is sort of just uh, used for the transmission of ideas. Here with Bitcoin, it's it's the exchange of things of value. And so it is literally commerce. And the one thing that the government has been pretty clear about is it pre preventing some guardrails on commerce. Um, and, and, and so it's a little different where we have, and, and at least in American ideology, we don't want to put on guardrails too much about speech. We want people to be able to communicate ideas freely, but we do want to make sure we have some guardrails on, on, on commerce because if it goes awry, they're, they're real, they're real world complications. And so uh, are there any guardrails that you think that the government should have on this or you're saying no? So I think there are places where guardrails of course make sense. One of those is in money transmission licensing. Um, another would be in if you're using these networks to raise money for a speculative investment. And so we saw in 2017, the so-called initial coin offering or ICO boom. In a lot of those offerings, people were being promised some future digital token that didn't yet exist. And they were accepting payments for those promises in Bitcoins or some existing digital token. And really those were just securities offerings. And usually, unfortunately, they were not compliant with the securities laws. And so the SEC has since brought several enforcement actions State securities regulators are uh, increasingly educated about these, these topics. I've spoken myself with the Association of State Securities Regulators on multiple occasions. These are places where guardrails make sense because there's so much hype and interest in this technology. And some of it's justified. It's very real innovation. It's very interesting. But when it's this hot and this interesting, you will find, regrettably, people who are willing to exploit the vulnerable by saying, I've got a better new Bitcoin. I've got something cool. Give me some money and I'll give you some of this. And if that's really just a promise of future profits, it's a security, as we've said multiple times to the SEC and should be regulated as such. So I'd say that is another area where guardrails make sense. The money transmission licensing for custodians makes sense. Um, 
and anti-money laundering controls make sense, as I mentioned at the in 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 the previous response. You know, it it makes sense that we would have on ramps and off ramps where people know their customers, where some level of suspicious activity reporting is going on, so that we can interdict and stop criminal flows of funds. Well, thank you, Peter. Thank you, uh, Senator uh, Street. I, I think. Uh, we achieve what we want to do, just a basic understanding. And based on Senator Street's questions, I think that's a whole nother meeting, possibly even hearings to, to start talking about that. I just wanted to try to build the foundation, what we're talking about. That's our first step, subsequent steps will come. So thank you to everybody attend. Uh, thank you. And I guess that's about it. We'll sign off. Thank you for your time. Thank you.